So, um, yeah, I took a lot of time trying to get my program to upload so that I could have you guys following along with me. So, um, I just want to jump right into it. The title of my lesson that I'm giving is The Mystery of God, One New Man. And I just want to identify what the mystery of God was and what did it consist of as far as um, the elements that identifies um, the fulfillment of this mystery of God. Um, the ver I want to start off where I had begun to even want to study the mystery of God because one day I was reading and um, I stumbled across the passage that speaks about the mystery of God and before that time, I don't even know if I had paid attention to that concept. And I'm like, well, what is the mystery of God? And that verse that caused me to um, start studying the mystery of God was Revelation 10, 7, where it says, John said, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin the psalm, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared to his servants the prophets. So I wanted to know what was the mystery of God because I, I knew that if I could identify what the mystery of God was, then I would be able to know if the seventh angel had blown the trumpet or not. Now, this word that uh, John used, finish, is a Greek word, now forgive me if I pronounce it incorrectly, but teleo, and the word means completed or accomplished or fulfilled. So at the sounding of the seventh or the last trumpet, the mystery of God would be completely accomplished or fulfilled. Well, I wanted to know from there, what is the mystery of God that was to be accomplished, finished, or fulfilled? And uh, Paul answered that question in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 3. Um, I had, I think I, I was on the uh, Esau app, and I think I typed in mystery of God. And... Uh, some verses popped up and this was the one that popped up that caught my eye the most and it gives a, a it gives precisely what the mystery of God is Ephesians chapter 3 verse 3 says how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Here's the mystery, guys. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So we have three concepts there in that mystery. We have the Gentiles becoming fellow heirs or being able to inherit a promise from God but that we're going to be in the same body as Israel. So they were going to be sharing, they were going to be the fellow heirs and in the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. So fellow heirs in the same body by the gospel. Well, um, Paul said that God joined Israel and the Gentiles together in the body of Christ, which is the church by the gospel was the mystery that was to be fulfilled. In other words, that when the church was fully established, the mystery of God would be fulfilled or accomplished or fully established. Well, is not the church of Christ accomplished or established? Are we not currently occupying a building where an assembly meets? Yes, we are. It seems like it would be simple, because in my personal opinion, that's sufficient enough evidence to confirm that the mystery of God is finished. Well, if the mystery of God is finished, that means that the seventh or the last trumpet has already been blown. However, we have many that are argued different, even though it's that simple. The mystery of God was a Jew and Gentile in one body by the gospel, which was the results of the church. The church is here. The church has been here. It seems simple, but for some reason, uh, the futurists want to make that a uh, difficult concept. So I want to take a look at a uh, look, uh, take a further look at a few verses and some more convincing scripture to demonstrate the fulfillment of the mystery of God. Now in verses 3 and 4, Paul reminds them that he had already told the Ephesians briefly 
what the mystery was and that it had been revealed to him and that everyone could know what was revealed to him by reading the epistle he wrote to them. He said that the mystery hadn't been revealed to anyone on earth until now and that it was now being revealed by the Holy Spirit to the apostles. Well, let's take a look at what Paul wrote for or before in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. This is when he said he wrote it for. This is where he wrote to them prior to chapter 3, mentioning the mystery of God. Wherein, verse 8, wherein he have abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of excuse me, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. In Ephesians 1.10, Paul says that the gathering of Israel and the Gentiles into the church was to occur in the fullness of time. And by the way, I just want to mention that um, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 said that at the fullness of time, we had Jesus born. That was a paraphrase. But Jesus was born at the fullness of time. So I just want to make note that the fullness, whenever this fullness of time was, it had to be during a period of time, whether it began or ended. Well, it had to at least been a beginning. It had to at least have begun while Jesus was here on earth because That's right. Jesus was here. He, he appeared in the fullness of time. Right. So I just wanted to throw that out there. That's uh, just something, a side note. But to continue, um, that uh, the church was to occur in the fullness, I mean, the, the Gentiles and Israel to one body, which is the church, was to occur in the fullness of time. Or in other words, when everything would be a practical fulfilled. Now, that word fullness used there by Paul is the Greek word, you have to excuse me, but play Roma. Play Roma. I believe that's how you pronounce that. And that word, as well as um, the word uh, finish means complete as well or completion as well. So it means to complete as well. So the mystery of God will be fulfilled not only at the seventh trump, but at the time that God's plan of salvation that was predestined or ordained before the world began, according to 1 Corinthians 2 7, was accomplished or fulfilled. Now in Colossians chapter 1, verses 25 through 27, Paul says, Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which have been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God will make known what is the richest of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, let's look right there in verse 27 that I'll touch on further, but I just want to point out verse 25 where Paul says that the ministry to the Gentiles had to happen in order to fulfill the word of God. Fulfill is um, the Greek word plero, plero. Um, <laughs> like I said, I'm going to butcher this. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that. But it's that Greek word right there on the screen. And it means to be complete or to complete or completion. Just like fullness, just like finish. So we understand that um, at the accomplishment or the fulfillment of the mystery of God, all things will be accomplished or fulfilled. And when I say all, I mean the eschaton, a.k.a. every word of God and his promises. So now that we know what the mystery of God is, or was, and that it was to be finished at the sound of the last trump, let's see if we can not pull out some time indicators of this fulfillment out of scripture and narrow them down to a specific time. I think a great starting point would be to examine the source of the revelation of the mystery of God. But before we go there, I just want to um, see what we've uh, reviewed so far. We have the mystery of God was to be finished at the sign of the last uh, trumpet, according to Revelation 10, 7. We find out that the mystery of God was Jew and Gentile into one body by the gospel in Ephesians 3 and Ephesians 1. And 
we see that it was predestined before the world began and it was to um, consummate the fulfillment of God's word or it was to fulfill the word of God according to Paul in first, I mean Colossians chapter 1. But Paul said that his source of the revelation was the mystery of God. I mean the source of the revelation of the mystery of God was the Holy Spirit. So it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Well, let's examine the Holy Spirit. In Joel chapter 2, um, Joel will say, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for Mount Zion and Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So, um, Joel said that it was to come in the last days, the spirit, before the great and terrible day of the Lord to come. Peter applied Joel 2 to the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 and following, affirming that there were that they were in the last days. According to the Hebrew writer, the last days and the end of the age are the same time period. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, God, who has sundry times and endeavors manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom we have appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So, Hebrews 1 says that God spoke through Jesus in the last days. And Hebrews 9.26 says, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but not once in the end of the age have he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So in Hebrews 9, 26, it says that it was at the end of the age when Jesus appeared. So Jesus appeared in the first century during the last days at the end of the age. Well, as I mentioned earlier in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it said, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Was made under the law, which means that the age that these writers had in mind was the Mosaic age, which means that the last days were the last days of the Mosaic age or the low law of Moses and the covenant Israel had with God. In other words, the last days of Israel. So the Holy Spirit was to be poured out in the last days of Israel. Furthermore, Zechariah chapter 12, hold on, I'm moving too fast. Let's go back. Furthermore, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 9 through 10 is about the last days of Israel, and God promised his spirit to be poured out at this time, agreeing with Joel 2. It was only to last for a specific, uh, specific period of time to serve a specific purpose. In Micah chapter 7, verse 15, according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. And that was just speaking about the work of the Spirit. So here, Micah, God, through Micah, said that he was going to show the marvelous things according to the time period in which it took them to come out of Egypt. Amen. Well, um, excuse me. God, according to the days of them coming out of Egypt, journeying through the wilderness. However, many days it was, according to that time, equals out to about 40 years according to the Hebrew writer in Hebrew chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. When the five, verse 9, when your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do all way err in their heart, and they have not known in my ways. Well, if you do the math, the answer comes out most precisely to an exact 40 years. The operation of the Holy Spirit to Israel and the restoring of the prophetic office began with the ministry of John the Baptist. The Bible tells us that he was filled with the Holy Ghost from the womb and the forerunner of Jesus Christ in Luke 1, 14 and following, but in verse 17 in particular. Now John was around 30 years of age when he came on the scene. We know that because according to Luke 
John was about six months older than Jesus, Luke 1, 26 and following. And Jesus was 30 when he was baptized, Luke 3, 23, which means John, being six months, about six months older than Jesus, well, at that time was about 30 and a half, or 30 and six months, however you want to look at it, when he baptized Jesus. The operation of the Spirit, so we have to begin that operation of the Spirit, came in the Spirit of Elijah, preaching and preparing for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And um, this was the first prophet that they had had in, I believe, like 400 years. And so you have John here um, coming on the scene, and the operation of the Spirit continued until the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 87. On 70 minus 30, it was 40. So according to the Bible, the Holy Spirit was to come in the first century and last 40 years. Zechariah confirms this in Zechariah 13, verses 2 through 4. And it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass out of the land. And it shall come to pass when they shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto them, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesied. And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed, every one of his vision, when he hath prophesied. Neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. So Zechariah was saying, and this is in the context of the destruction of Jerusalem, he said that this time was going to come a period where the uh, prophets and the unclean spirits was going to pass out the land. So with the spirit passing out the land, that means no more prophecies, that means no more visions, that means no more operation of the spirit because it's passed out the land. No longer is the spirit is in operation. And this was according to the destruction of Jerusalem, which occurred in 87. And as I said before, this is about those last days of Jerusalem. This is about the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, Daniel confirms this as well in Daniel 9, 24, which is also a prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem. Verse 24, chapter 9, in Daniel, Daniel will say, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make the end of sins and to make uh, reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Here it is in the context of the destruction of the city and um, the filling up the measure of their sins and God um, bringing everlasting righteousness, bringing salvation. It says that vision and prophecy will be sealed up as well. Once again, confirming that this vision, I mean that the spirit was only to last until the destruction of the holy city or AKA 87. Okay, no where am I? Um, one moment. All right, so the purpose of the, and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. So we we examined um, when the Holy Spirit was to come and how long it was supposed to last. Well, now I want to take a look at the purpose of the Holy Spirit because the purpose, excuse me, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is found in the book of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter thirty-six. Ezekiel 36, starting at the 24th verse, says, For I will take you from among the heathen. Now, here it is. He's talking to Israel. He's um, speaking to, at this time, we had a divided kingdom with the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes. More so, Judah being in the northern tribe, I mean, the south, who remained um, keeping, somewhat keeping the covenant of God. They still were rebellion and, in their sin as well, but for a time period, they were more honorable than uh, the ten northern tribes, but even so, the Bible speaks on how they even got more wicked than there, more wicked than the ten uh, northern tribes. But anywho, verse 24 says, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Ah, will I cleanse you? A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments. 
and do them. God is talking about a new birth for Israel. By the way, this is the source of Jesus' teaching to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, that he and the rest of Israel must be born again. There's a lot there, but I can't touch on that right now. But this new birth was to take place at the time of the gathering of Israel. The same gathering that according to Ezekiel chapter 37, 11 and following, in which the resurrection will take place. In Ezekiel 37, a chapter after, the Bible says, Then, verse 11, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our part. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus said the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I am the Lord, that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. So the gathering, the resurrection, and the new birth are all the same event because these things are equal. Because things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. The Holy Spirit purpose was gathering resurrection, the gathering, the resurrection, and the new birth of Israel. Sounds like a new creation to me. So I think it's safe to say that the Holy Spirit was to come in the last days of Israel, which we discovered was in the first century, and was to last for 40 years, and its purpose was to create God's new people, a.k.a. Christians. So when the Spirit was poured out, they understood that this was leading up to the regathering, the resurrection, or the restoration of the whole house of Israel. It is precisely why the apostles asked the question to Jesus before his ascension, after the promise of the Holy Spirit in Acts 1, if at that time will he restore the kingdom to Israel. The Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2, and in Acts 3 they preached the judgment and the restoration, and in Acts 4 they preached the resurrection. Now let's take a look at the gathering, the same gathering that allowed the Gentiles to become fellow heirs of the promises to Israel. Just a quick note, since the resurrection was to occur through the operation of the Spirit, it would have to happen while the Spirit was still in operation. Right. So with the operation of the Spirit, which futurists, I believe most, would agree, ceased in AD 70, how do you have a resurrection when the Spirit was used for resurrection? That's right. And um, uh, it would have to happen while the Spirit was still in operation. So any resurrection that is to happen after the operation of the Holy Spirit is unbiblical, point blank, period. And you can't separate the promise to the Gentiles from that of Israel because the Gentiles will rejoice with Israel according to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43, which we'll take a look at here in a moment. But I just want to go back to where we looked over. It was revealed by the Holy Spirit. The, um, the, the mystery of God was revealed to Paul by the Holy Spirit. It was coming the last days at the end of the age and it was to last for 40 years, according to Micah 7.15. And its purpose was for the resurrection and gathering of God's people. Well, according to Deuteronomy 32, verse 20 and 21, the Bible says, and he said, I will hide my face from them. Can everyone hear me good back there? Because every time I get here, I get loud. I'm just making sure you can hear me. Okay, thank you. And he said, I will hide my face from them, and I will see what their end shall be. And they are a very forward generation, in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with the foolish nation. So, according to Deuteronomy, the Gentiles will be called in the last days of Israel, because... The Song of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 32, is about the last days of Israel. Um, God had told Moses to write the song down and teach the song to the children of Israel, and it was about their last days. Um, at least 
twice, but I believe it's three times in Deuteronomy 32, it says it was about that latter end. It was so it was about the the last days of Israel, was Israel's last days and the covenant that they had with God. Paul alluded to the fulfillment of this promise in Deuteronomy 32, 20, and 21 in his day during the first century. Paul quotes Deuteronomy 32, 21 in Romans 10, verses 16 through 19. It says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah, or Isaiah said, Lord, who have believed our report so that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God? But I say, have they not heard? Yes, really, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know first Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation I will anger you. So, here it is. Paul is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 32 during his ministry. It was really like his validation for his ministry to the Gentiles. And anytime a New Testament writer quotes an Old Testament scripture that's within context of the subject that he's speaking on, which is the um, rejecting and accepting of the gospel or which is the calling of Israel which in Deuteronomy chapter 32 we'll see Jesus, I mean God said he's going to provoke them to anger this is the same exact quote so Paul in his mind was understand, I mean so the, the audience understood that in Paul's mind he was referencing Deuteronomy chapter 32 being fulfilled which means all of Deuteronomy chapter 32 being, the, being fulfilled. Now I kind of explained that a little wrong, but the basis of what I'm saying is that since Paul quoted Deuteronomy chapter 32 in the first century right here in Romans 10, he's saying that Deuteronomy chapter 32 is being fulfilled currently yeah, right now while he is um, speaking to them right now. In Romans chapter 15 verses 9 through 12, not only does um, Paul quote Deuteronomy chapter 32 43 which says rejoice all you nations or all you Gentiles with his people for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people um, so what we have right here Paul quoted this as well in the New Testament in Romans chapter 15 talking to the Romans and the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name and again he said rejoice ye Gentiles with his people that's the exact same thing that was said in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and again praise the Lord all ye Gentiles and law him all ye people and again Isaiah said there shall be a root of Jesse and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him shall the Gentiles trust now here in verse 12, Paul is quoting Isaiah 11, 10, which posits the calling of the Gentiles at the time of the gathering and the saving of the remnant, which leads me to my next point in which where the remnant will be saved, how in, um, hold on, my, my son, look, it didn't go where it's supposed to go. So, um, we have, um, in Deuteronomy 32, 43, right here in the latter part, it says, and will rend it says, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries. This uh, and will be merciful unto his land. Here we have the vindication of the martyrs being spoken about right here, where God will avenge the blood of his saints and those who you know die for the word of God. But in Isaiah 11, 10, when it speaks about the gathering, that lets us know. Once again, that when the Gentiles will rejoice with God's people, that it will be during the gathering. So the Gentiles will be called to salvation in the last days of Old Covenant Israel, which was in the first century, at the time of the gathering, and at the time of the saving of the remnant and the vindication of the martyrs. And we'll touch on all those points. I know I threw a lot there, but later on in the study, we'll pick back up and we'll see if we can uniform that and make it a little more understandable. The Gentile will be called by the same gospel that Israel will reject. 
same gospel that Israel would reject. We have here in Isaiah chapter 60 where um, God prophesied about the Gentiles coming to the light, about the salvation of the Gentiles, about the calling of the Gentiles. In verse 1 it says, Arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentile shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Verse 5, the sea shall be converted unto thee, while well, then thou shalt see and flow together, and thy heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. So, and um, here it is, God is saying it was going to come a time when the Gentiles will come to the light, and that they shall be converted, that they shall be saved as well, just like the promise had been made to Israel. So, we not only have him, we not only have God saying that the Gentiles will come and that they will be called, but it also says in chapter 2, for Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem, Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness. That's evangelism, which would allow for the Gentiles to be converted, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth, and the Gentiles do this. Uh, righteousness going forth his brightness shall see thy righteousness and all the kings thy glory and thou shalt be called by a new name so he's saying here that the Gentiles would um, be called and that it would be through evangelism and we understand that, that evangelism was going to come by the gospel from Ephesians chapter 3 verses 6 and that not only will it come, but that, or will they come into the fold, but they'll be called by a new name. So we have God here speaking about creation. The group of people that God was creating from the merging of the house of Israel. Wait, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, I skipped over a lot, I'm sorry. Let me, um, so to make a long story short, Paul is saying that Deuteronomy chapter 32, 21 is being fulfilled right then and there. Then God was provoking Israel to jealousy by offering salvation to the Gentiles because of their rebellion and rejection of the gospel. Paul affirmed that in Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Now Romans 11 and following says basically that God was going to reoffer salvation to those of Israel who would repent. This group was often referred to as the remnant of Israel or a righteous remnant. In verse 26 of Romans 11, Paul says that all Israel would be saved, but in Romans 9, 27, while speaking of the calling of the Gentiles, that even though the nations of Israel was as the sand of the sea in number, only a remnant would be saved. So we must apply that Paul's affirming that the remnant of Israel that would repent would be saved. This group of people that God was creating from the merging of the house of Israel, which included the two southern tribes and ten northern tribes, aka the diaspora, along with the Gentiles, would become God's new chosen people and receive a new name after the destruction of his former people. We can read all about this. In Isaiah chapter 65, verses 1 through 18. Now I want to um, go through the chapter. I'm going to pick a few verses that I want to point out. And I want to try to um, demonstrate here this new creation that had been in the plan from God. And how he had already prophesied about it coming. But not only about it coming, what would come with this coming of this new creation. I want to start in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 1. He said, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am fond of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. Now this here is a conflation of Romans 9.25 and Romans 10.20. So, once again, Paul is quoting a scripture in the first century. Paul is quoting an Old Testament scripture in the first century which means that Paul had in his mind the fulfillment of the scripture that he was quoting. So technically, whatever we read until scripture implies otherwise was fulfilled in the first century as well. From chapter 1 on down to verse 18, as long as it's still in the context, which it will be, then everything that Paul, I mean that Isaiah is speaking about here was fulfilled in the first century because Paul quotes verse 1 being fulfilled 
in the verse uh, first century. Isaiah, we'll jump to verse 4. Which were man among the graves and lodged in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and brought from abominable things, is in their vessels. So they were in their graves, but still eating. So this has to be sin death or spiritual death. We're not talking about physical death. So right here he's saying Judah was dead. He's saying that they was dead, and obviously it was being, them being dead in their sins. Verse 5, which say, Stand by thyself. Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but will recompense, even recompense, into that bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains, and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. And this is the judgment of Israel from the filling up the measure of their sins and also the vindication of the martyrs. In my personal opinion, this is the inspired commentary. I mean, the inspired commentary of these verses is Matthew chapter 23 and Luke 13, which goes into details about Israel filling up the measure of their sins and the judgment that was to come upon them due to that sin. Verse 8, Thus said the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one said, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. This is the saving of the righteous remnant, remnant, which would occur at the time of the judgment of Israel, judging the salvation of Israel, obviously, obviously goes hand in hand. Isaiah 65 and 9, And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and my elect shall inherit it, and my servant shall dwell there. Short and simple, the king, aka the church. Verse 12. Now, therefore will I number you to the sword, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I call, you do not answer. When I spake, you do not hear, but did evil before my eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. Therefore, because of what they did in verse 12. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servant shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. Behold, my servant shall shame for joy of heart, for you shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vaccination of spirit. Now Jesus references this in Matthew 22 in the parable of the wedding banquet, which means Right along with the rest of these verses that we're reading that um, verse 1 preceded, the wedding occurred in the first century as well. You have many that will say that it occurred, and you have some that say that it didn't occur, but according to um, Paul quoting Isaiah 65, and Isaiah 65, speaking of this wedding banquet that was to go on in the time, that means that it was fulfilled in the first century as well. In verse 15 it says, And you shall see your name for a curse. You shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. That he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that swerves in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. Because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from my eyes. God promises judgment and salvation. In verse 15, God said he would destroy them. In verse 16, he says that Israel's former troubles wouldn't be Remember, they was going to take away their sins. Also, he states that they would receive a new name, just like in Isaiah chapter 62. And we understand already that the Gentiles and Israel both were to receive this new name. But now we know it would happen after God slayed Israel. And after the slaying of Israel, Isaiah says that when God says to Isaiah, For behold, I created new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Now, I just want to say that this is the same new heaven and earth that John speaks about in Revelation 21. Also, Peter, 2 Peter 3. I didn't put much on this particular slide because I want to touch on that a little further. But I just want to bring to everyone's attention that what we discovered when we began this text that since Isaiah doesn't change the context or narrative of the text according to Isaiah 65 verse 1, which is Romans 9.25 and Romans 10.20 conflated, 
which Paul affirms fulfilled in the first century, that the whole chapter of Isaiah 65 was fulfilled in the first century. Might I add, Isaiah 65 was fulfilled at the time that the temple was to be destroyed and the holy city of Jerusalem was left desolate according to Isaiah chapter 64. The holy cities are a wilderness. These, according to Isaiah 64, Isaiah doesn't switch subjects in the chapter break. It should have never had um, been a chapter break inserted here. We have Isaiah 64, 10 and 11, and then you have Isaiah 65. But prior to Isaiah 65, 1, it says, the holy cities are a wilderness, Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praised it is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid to waste. So we have to understand that Isaiah 65 was also in the context of the destruction of Jerusalem. So the destruction of the old heavens and earth comes the new heavens and earth. So I want to just take a look at what while we uh, just went over because it was a kind of cloudy, I will admit. But we have the gathering. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Really? We have the gathering. Um, the promise was made in Deuteronomy. Wow. Um, this promise to be gathered in Isaiah, calling of Israel and Gentiles was being fulfilled in Paul's day. It would be converted through evangelism and they would receive a new name and the decision would happen that uh, the new, the old heaven and earth would be slayed and the new one would, man, I can't believe I lost time like that. Oh, man, okay, so, um, so, um, it would be one in Christ. We would have a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul would say, any man being Christ, he is a new creation. Um, all things become new and all things have passed away. While in Isaiah, I mean, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, we have um, the new creation, the Christians being called, I mean, the new church being called Christians at Antioch in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And um, the creation was one new man and it took place in Christ, Ephesians 2, 10 and 15. In Ephesians 2, 1, the Gentiles were dead and it, it was spiritually. In Ephesians 2, 5, Israel was dead spiritually. While in Ephesians 2, 6, both was resurrected or raised from the dead together with Christ. Also, seated the place in company with Christ. So, according to Ephesians 3, 6, uh, the two bodies were put in one. Paul confirms there's only one body. Ephesians 1, 22, 23, it's the body that's being saved, a.k.a. the church, which Christ is the head of. Ephesians 3, 6 and 1 Corinthians 15 lets us know that those in the body of the church was being saved, was and are being saved by the gospel. Um, let me see. Let me pick up the fact a little bit. I'm totally sorry. I don't know how. So according to Paul, the new creation broke in during the old creation in the first century. They were dead in their trespasses and rose to walk in the newness of life, being born again. A new creature and a new creation, which is the new man, which is the church. Those who have obeyed the gospel are the body, and Christ is the head. There's only one, just like there is only one hope, which was the hope of resurrection from the dead. So you can't have both. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Just like we used this verse to assert that there's only one baptism that was valid at the time Paul wrote this was water baptism. The only hope, which was the hope of resurrection that was valid at the time Paul wrote this, was the one accomplished through baptism because this other fairy tale make believe hope of a physical resurrection is supposedly yet future. The futures would agree that the resurrection through baptism was valid when Paul wrote Ephesians, but they turn around and teach that there is two hopes, multiple hopes, if you let the dispensationists tell it. This is the same hope Paul was talking about in Acts chapter 24, verse 15, and Acts 26, 7. And that was the hope of Israel. The same one that once upon a time the Gentiles were lacking in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. They were resurrected into this new Bible. And that's what I just have done showing. Paul said that he had, that God had put the two in one body, which by the way implies that there was two bodies. And since each body represented a group of people, the bodies aren't singular or physical bodies, but corporate and collective bodies. Like Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that it was a covenant people or a covenant creation. Anyways, he also said that there was only one and that this one was the church of Christ. So the new body, the new man, the new creation was the church where God would dwell with man eternally. 
by the gospel, which is the foundation of the church, where salvation is. The authority and establishment of the church through the gospel in Christ was the real mystery. Tearing down the middle wall of partition and putting an end to racism, making us all one in Christ. One in Christ. Here we is, you got Jesus says, at that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. At that day you should know that, oh, I got the same verse there. It wasn't supposed to be like that. All right. But he said, <laughs> you and me. So Christ is everyone, just like he promised right here. I mean, wasn't that the goal for God to dwell with mankind again, to reverse the curse of the garden? Remember what Peter said in Acts chapter 3, 21, that Jesus must reign in the heavens until the restitution of all things. That word restitution is only found in the Bible one time, and that's right here. And according to there, the Greek word apokastis, Estasis means to restore to the perfect state before the fall. When well, the perfect state before the fall of man was God dwelling with man in the garden. Eden was God's world or his kingdom. Man, aka Adam, was born into it by God putting his spirit in man, just like God put his spirit in man for the new creation, which Christians are today beginning in the first century. Man was born there and remained there in the garden until they sinned, and God placed him outside of the garden. Before this, man was with God and God was with man, just like it is now. If you have obeyed the gospel and living as a faithful Christian, are you not with God or in God and God in you or with God or God with you? Yes, you're in the kingdom of God, which was the accomplishment or fulfillment of the mystery of God, which has been here for over 2,000 years. It has many titles, one headquarters, and location, and that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Known as the house of God, the holy temple of God. Holy City of God, Heaven Jerusalem. These are all the results of the mystery of God being finished. Heaven Jerusalem, Church of Christ, New Heaven, New Earth, New Jerusalem, Bride of Christ, the Church of Christ, the Church of Christ. Um, okay, uh, if one is here, then all is here because they are the same exact entity. In Hebrews 12, the Hebrew writer said that the New Jerusalem was present in the first century. And God said that the new heavens and earth, a.k.a. the new creation, a.k.a. new Jerusalem, will remain as long as God remains in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22, which is eternal according to Deuteronomy 32, 27. In other words, the results of the mystery of God, which is the church, will remain forever. Amen. Now let's take a quick look at another detrimental eschatological event that was to take place at the sound of the seventh trumpet in order to drive my point home. The seventh trumpet is blown in Revelation 10, but it's also blown in Revelation 11. Well, before, in verse 8, before verse 15 and verse 8 of Revelation 11, the trumpet is blown after the great city where our Lord was crucified is destroyed. Unequivocally, that's Jerusalem. That's sufficient enough to say that Jerusalem was destroyed at the sound of the seven, I mean, that the seven trumpet was blown because it was blown after the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem has been destroyed. It's been destroyed for over 2,000 years. But I, I will continue to prove my point. In Revelation 16 and 6 and 19, this great city was responsible for shedding the blood of the saints and the old covenant prophets. Revelation 18 20, they were responsible for killing Jesus' apostles. Revelation 18 24, they were responsible for all the blood shed on the earth. Acts 7 52, so Stephen would say, would ask the Jews, which one of the prophets had they not killed? You know, what prophet had you not persecuted or scourged? Luke 13, 33, Jesus would say that basically it was just not right for a prophet to perish outside of Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem is the only city that portrays the image or identity of Babylon, a revelation. I had here where Jesus was, uh, he incorporated all of these elements that uh, applied to this great city right here in Matthew 23 in which he told them that they were going to uh, fill up the measure of their sins and that their house was going to be left desolate to them. I want to point to the point though, right here it says in verse 36, Verily I say unto you, all these things should come upon this generation. And then he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. In other words, Jerusalem was Responsible for killing the prophets, and responsible for killing Jesus. Apostles, it was, they were responsible for killing Jesus. And this great city, aka Babylon, was also responsible for all those things. Which means, and there's no other city that you could try to put in place um, of Babylon than Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the only city that fits um, that. Please give me just two more minutes, and the lesson will be yours. 
So, at the sound of the last trumpet, the mystery of God will be finished. Israel and the Gentiles together in the body of Christ by the gospel is the mystery of God. The fulfillment of the mystery of God is the church. The bride of the Lamb is the new heavens and the earth. The new heaven and the earth is the new Jerusalem. The Hebrew writer said that they were in the new Jerusalem in the first century. The Holy Spirit was to come in the last days of Israel, was to last for 40 years, and his purpose was to create the new Jerusalem. The operation of the Holy Spirit began with John the Baptist coming to the Spirit of Elijah in AD 30. The operation of the Holy Spirit ceased at the fall of the old Jerusalem in AD 70, in which the new Jerusalem flowed out of. The time period from AD 30 to AD 70 was 40 years. The new Jerusalem has been here for over 2,000 years and will remain as God, I mean, as long as God remains, which is eternal. So the mystery of God has been finished for over 2,000 years. Therefore, the seventh trumpet has been blown. Babylon, therefore, Babylon was destroyed at the, I mean, and Babylon was destroyed at the sound of the last trumpet. Therefore, and Babylon was old covenant of Israel, Jerusalem, as we just discovered. Old covenant of Israel, a.k.a. Babylon, was destroyed in AD 70. Oh, it was destroyed in AD 70. Those are some more things that were to occur during the destruction of this old covenant of Israel, Jerusalem, or Babylon. And the reason why I'm pointing out the emphasis of this destruction, because remember in Isaiah 65, at the destruction of the old people, or old covenant Israel, or the old Jerusalem, or the old heaven and earth will come anew. Well, these things also occur within that destruction. Then the millennium passing of heaven and earth, the wedding, the vindication of martyrs, the judgment, the resurrection, the destruction of Satan, and the destruction of Hades. So old covenant destroyed in AD 70, new covenant, new covenant established in AD 70, so the mystery of God was finished in 87. Sorry for running over. I don't even know how I lost track of time, but I appreciate your attention and your patience. God bless you. That's it.